check. Yeah. No, I have, yeah. I have mine. Yeah. If you need yours. Yeah, I'm not using mine for okay. anything, so. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll put this one in. I just have to figure Let's out how to put that on. I want to get this to say no one we're live. It's about time. Good morning, Harvest. How are we doing this morning? Let's try that again. Good morning, Harvest. How are we doing this morning? Ah, it's good to see everybody. So the ugly sweater contest. I feel like I'm the one winning here. <laughs> it's getting a little warm with that sun coming out, but we're, we're happy to have everybody here. I'm glad we're not freezing, uh, freezing out this morning. Uh, for those of you that are joining us online, thank you so much for being with us. Um, trying to live stream out here uh, outside today for the first time, so hopefully it goes smooth. I would love it if you guys would share this on Facebook, share it on YouTube. Those of you guys that are here as well, you can pop your phones out, hit share. Great way to share the gospel this morning. Before we get into it, we're going to open in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and praise you this morning. Lord, I pray for just a meaningful worship this morning. Father, we just pray that you would bless your congregation, bless your worship team this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid you're not the only we are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free it's all you got to lean on but thank god that's all you need and all the people said amen whoa said amen if you're rich or poor well it don't matter we go strong you know love is what we're after we're all broken but we're all in this together god knows we stumble and fall he's the love of the world he sent his son to save us all and all the people said amen whoa whoa Kingdom of God, and all the people said Amen. Whoa, whoa, oh, and all the people said Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said Amen. And all the people said Amen. Whoa, whoa, oh, and all the people said Amen. and greet your neighbor this morning. So I got, uh, I got somebody running and grabbing some lyrics for us. I sort of dropped the ball this morning on handing those out. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. So we got some lyrics for all the songs that we'll be playing this morning, and they will be out here in a moment. 
with that, we're just going to go right into the next song here. So. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You sin or to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our god we are more than conquerors through christ you have overcome this world He is the conqueror. 
So the, there's some research that was done by some psychologists that suggests that we have two complementary motivational systems. One is the thinking system, and the other is the doing system. And we are greatly, uh, or we're generally capable of only doing one. Fact of the matter, I can only multitask on one thing, so I don't multitask well. Obviously, you see that with the papers. <laughs> so if you tend to focus more on your thinking system, you'll get caught up in a life of inaction. And what we want is progress, right? We want progress in life, in our career, in our faith. And that can only manifest through action. So we're called to be doers, not hearers, right? Doers of the word, not hearers of the word. So I encourage you on this next, one, uh, next song here to join us. There's a grace when this heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone It was another in the fire Standing next to me It was another in the water Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free Is the cross that bears the burden Would another die for me Is another in the fire
Count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be As I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between where it's in I can feel the ground check beneath us As the prison walls cave in Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. Be a lover in the fire, standing next to me. Be another in the waters, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminded how good you've been to me? Count the joy, come every battle. I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I see your face in every sunrise The colors of the morning are inside your eyes The world awakens in the light of the day I look up to the sky and say You're beautiful You're beautiful
we do see that you are beautiful, Lord. And we are just looking forward to that time that we can arrive at eternity's shore. Father God, we're just grateful that anything that happens here on earth, Lord, that you you are just fully in control. Lord, we live in such crazy times right now, and it, it's so hard to find peace in our day-to-day lives sometimes, Lord. But, Father, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to us continually, every day, hour by hour, minute by minute, Lord. Reveal yourself to us so we can find that peace and live in that peace with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Want to say welcome, church. Great to see you here today. Thanks for those joining us online as well. Great to see you. It is good to be together in God's great chapel of the outdoors. Amen. Amen. So just a couple announcements. First up, I want to give a big clap to Ed Keen, who has faithfully brought us uh, coffee for all these weeks, helps us set up. Coco as well today. Let's give Ed a big clap, church. Come on. Thank you, Ed. Also want to give a huge thanks to Miss Sharon for not only cooking the bars for us this morning, but individually wrapping each and every one of them. Let's give Sharon a big clap. Thank you, Sharon. And last but not least, uh, both Kelly and Steve Walshmitt completed the cap on our roof that needed to be uh, done. So it's ventilated properly. Thank you for that. And I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful to see you here today. Thankful that we can enjoy the outdoors one more Sunday at least here. Uh, We will communicate when we go back in. We're just watching the weather. Usually we make the call by Wednesday uh, just so that uh, we know what's coming up. But um, communicate with us through email, on Facebook, on the website as well. And you can uh, stay in touch with us that way. Uh, Last and not least, we are going to have a picture afterwards. For everyone who is wearing a wacky or ugly sweater. So if you did dress up in your not-so-finest, please join us, let's say, over there afterwards, and we'll get a picture because, hey, let's have some fun with this, right? We have to meet outside anyway. So, All right, with that, I'm going to take this off because it's super hot. So I'm going to do the pastor thing and say, uh, say hello to your neighbor one more time. All right. All right. Thank you for enduring an awkward moment. (laughs) You guys are awesome. (laughs) Thank you, those watching online. I hope you're still watching online. This morning, we are uh, continuing on in a sermon series that we started last week that I've titled Carriers. And, you know, we're all afraid that one of us might be carriers of COVID. Hopefully no one here is a carrier of COVID. Can I hear an amen? Come on. But ultimately... I think that as Christians in this time, in this season, in this pandemic, those of us who are following Jesus, we need to be carrying something much different than what the world is carrying. The world is carrying a lot of fear. The world is carrying a lot of doubt. The world is carrying a lot of distrust, a lot of despair. But you know what? As people who are connected through Jesus by faith to God Almighty, We should be carrying something different. Can I hear an amen? And one of those things that I want to focus on this morning is that my wife is carrying the children. Children, you are free to go. Pam Feeblecorn is taking you this morning. Thank you. But in addition to carrying children, we should be carrying hope. If you have a child named Hope, that worked, but okay. Um, So hope... As uh, Noah Webster talked about it in his 1828 dictionary, I love the 1828. You can look it up online because in doing so, you can see definitions where I think the words were more true to the English language, but in addition, he uses a lot of scripture. So just type in Google 1828 uh, Noah Webster. And he says about hope, he says, it's a desire of some good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of obtaining it, or a belief that it is obtainable. 
He says, hope differs from wish and desire in this. It implies some expectation of obtaining the good desired or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure or joy, whereas wish and desire may produce or be accompanied with pain and anxiety. We all have had hopes that have not been anchored in anything real. And what happens is, it, but, uh, Proverbs actually says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So we need to be very careful what we put our hope in. But you know what, church? We have something solid to put our hope in. And, and, and so we can have confidence that what we are hoping for will come true. And that's, that's what I want to focus on this morning. If you have your Bible or if you want to turn digitally with me, 1 Peter chapter 1 is where I'm going to be. I'll be preaching from the New Living Translation uh, as we go there. So it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctifi sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, Peter was writing to Christians who had been dispersed from their homeland because of persecution. In being displaced from Jerusalem, you can imagine they were enduring some hardship in these foreign lands. And he's writing to them about hope. So let's pick up in verse 3. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a, get this, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So that term living hope, it means life, breath, to be among the living. Church, we have life, we have hope, we have breath. We are among the living because we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And so Peter's saying this, this isn't a nice wish that someday we'll rise again and reign with Christ forever. No, he says this is a living, certain hope guarded by your faith in Christ. And you need to have a faith in Christ. Guess what? Your mama's faith is not going to get you into heaven. Your attendance on Sunday alone is not going to get you into heaven. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ for yourself. But he's saying that promise, that hope is living, it's alive, it's active, it's enduring. And so we have hope for this life and we have hope for the next life. I was reminded this week uh, an argument or a way of thinking. It's called Pascal's Wager. And uh, Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician, lived in the 1600s. I think I remember studying something about him in science, about a different uh, scale of uh, uh, looking at heat. But anyway, he wagered about God. And he said, either God exists or he does not exist. And since neither proposition can be proved, we must wager, he said. If we wager that God exists and we are right, we win everything. If we wager that God exists and we are wrong, we lose nothing. You would be impudent, Pascal said, to wager that God does not exist. So Pascal infers that if you wager that God does not exist and you are wrong, you will suffer eternally. Whereas if you wager that he exists in this life, yes, you might have suffered a few things because you're living for Jesus, trying to be holy for him. But if that's all you've lost, you've lost nothing. But you've gained eternity in heaven. And he says, that's a wager I am willing to make. Lord Byron rephrased Pascal's argument as, indisputably, the firm believers in the gospel have a great advantage over all others for this simple reason, that if true, they will have their reward hereafter. And if there be no hereafter, they can be but with the infidel in his eternal sleep. 
And I like how he says this. Having had the assistance of an exalted hope through life. In other words, we who hope in Christ have something that we are believing and trusting in. And even if we're wrong and there is no God, we've lived with hope in this life. People are losing hope. They're losing faith. They're losing themselves in this pandemic. Church, we need to hang on to Christ and the strong hope that he has given us. Hope, yeah, amen. Hope in our systems, hope in the government, hope in the school, hope in whatever. It's pretty shaky right now, all around, because no one can really make any solid promises these days because COVID messes up everything, it seems. But our hope in Christ is eternal, it's secure. We can hold on to it as an anchor for our soul. Hebrews 6 uses this terminology. The context is talking about God blessing Abraham and the promise of blessing that God gave to Abraham. He wrote in Hebrews 6, verse 16, he says, Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge, I like that terminology. You know, maybe there were people who were actually fleeing. But, you know, we flee to Jesus out of this world, out of its systems. Those who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us, it says. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And one commentator put it this way, talking about these verses, and I just love how he puts it. He said, while the metaphor of the anchor is widely used in antiquity, it occurs only here in the New Testament. A ship firmly anchored is safe from idle drifting. Its position and safety are sure. So hope is a stabilizing force for the Christian. Can I hear an amen? Soul is a general word that probably means the life of a human being. The author is not saying simply that hope secures the spiritual aspect of a person. He is affirming that hope forms an anchor for the whole of life. I know that without my hope in Jesus, without that anchor, I don't even want to think about where I would be right now. I, you know, just freaking out. I mean, trusting in all the wrong things, trying to make life work. And ultimately, those hopes will all one day vanish, right? It says, he who hopes in Old Testament terminology, horses and chariots, his hope is in vain. But we will hope in the Lord. We will trust in the Lord. What are your chariots? What are your horses you've been trusting in? The financial system, the markets, the government, whatever. It's a vain hope compared to the hope of Jesus. And so we should have more stability, more ability to be firm, solid than the world around us because our hope is real. Our our hope is firm. Our hope is secure. He writes, those with a living hope have a steady anchor in all they do, giving them solid footing and security. And there's something more. It says, hope enters the inner sanctuary. The imagery takes us back to the tabernacle with its curtain shutting off the most holy place. There was a great curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place. And when Jesus came, it was torn in two, symbolizing we can go to the most holy place with God each and every day. But he writes, that little room symbolized the very presence of God, but people were not allowed to enter it. But hope can, says the author. The Christian hope is not exhausted by what it sees of earthly possibilities. It reaches into the very presence of God. I love that idea that hope has gone before us into heaven, into the inner sanctuary of the heavenly temple. And it's like a a cord holding us steadfast that we have a secure line directly to heaven because of our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. 
Picking up in verse 6, back to 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 6. It says, this, In this you rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what does he say trials do? They test the genuineness of of our faith. Church, I'm a little concerned for the church in America, the church worldwide right now. I'm concerned because sometimes I think people had more stake in what the church looked like or functioned like or had a format of than they had stake in the fact that church is a place you go to connect with Jesus. And you can do church anywhere, right? Because the church is the the people of God. And I always believe that there will be gatherings. These these Christians that Peter was writing to, they had been dispersed because of persecution. It said that the apostle Paul, he was Saul at the time, stood at Stephen's uh, stoning. Stephen was the first deacon of the church, and he spoke about Jesus, and the religious leaders hated him and stoned him on the spot. And Saul stood there and approved of it before Jesus got a hold of him. And out of that, it says that the church was scattered to all these places that Peter mentioned right away. I want, I desire to be meeting inside, no masks, no distancing, none of that stuff. But you know what? I'm not going to let that stuff prevent me from having church. Amen? I've heard that COVID is called the great disruption. You know, I, we're not under persecution because of it right now, but we are under disruption. And it's difficult, and by heart, it is, it is hard. It is heavy to um, have to worship, not in our building, that kind of thing. But Jesus is so much bigger. He's our living hope, and his church is so much bigger. And so I'm just, I'm excited. I'm blessed by you. I'm blessed by seeing you today because it shows me that you're in love with Jesus and you're not just in love with the building. Come on. So thank you for being here and thank you for putting up with all we've been through this last season. You know, I don't know again how much longer we'll be outside, but, but uh, I'm blessed by you. I'm blessed by your faithfulness to Jesus and to our church. So Peter's saying, hang in there, family of God. Hang in there. You have a living hope through the resurrection from the dead, through Jesus Christ. And in verse 8, Peter explains that our hope for tomorrow actually fills us with hope for today. He says in verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he's saying, yes, that hope is out there. It's eternal. But you know what? Even though you're not there yet, you love the God who is going to give you the promises that your hope is placed in. And so Jesus is our anchor today. He is our hope today. It's not just out there in the future sometimes. We love the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He wrote in verse 10, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied, about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. I'm going to give you the Cliff's notes on that. Basically, what he is saying is that all of the Old Testament prophets, all of the righteous people of the Old Testament, they were prophesying for a greater day. That greater day is the New Testament reality where God has invaded earth from heaven and he lives among us through the Holy Spirit. That is the day they were looking forward to. That is the reality that we get to walk in. So he goes on to talk about how do we live since we have this living hope. He writes in verse 22, 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So there's three major points I want to take from chapter 1 of 1 Peter. The first is keep our eyes on the living hope. It's eternal, it's out there, but it's real. And we have a greater hope than the rest of the world around us. Second is walk in his love because of our hope today. Stay connected with Jesus, right? If, if we're not connected to him, if our hope doesn't remain in him, we will wander, we will uh, be blown about by every wind that comes our way. But because we have hope, both eternally and for now. He says, love the people around you. Love the brotherhood earnestly. In other words, offer people hope. You know, there was a, there's a, an interesting little story in 1 Samuel. And King Saul was the king at that time, and his son Jonathan was one of his warriors. And Saul proclaimed, there cannot be anyone... Uh, No one can eat food until the end of the day when the battle is over and we've won. Now, that all sounds good, but really this is a story about making bad oaths. But Jonathan, he went about his day. He didn't hear what his dad had said, and he found some honey in the woods, and he ate that honey. And it says that his eyes lit up, and he was able to go and, and, and continue his conquest and overcame the enemy of the Philistines. At the end of the day, he comes back to dad and the troops and And uh, his dad says, whoever ate is going to be put to death. And ultimately, the troops uh, surrounded Jonathan and said, no, not today. Let's not let any more bloodshed happen. And Jonathan said, see, look what happened. When I ate this little bit of honey, my eyes brightened. You know, church, I think of that sometimes in the context of encouragement. Sometimes we just need a little bit of honey, if you will, of encouragement from the people around us. That might be friends. That might be family. That might be someone you don't know. You know, teachers were instrumental in my life as I grew up. Encouraging. You know, just encouraging. Church, we need to be the greatest encouragers the world has seen. Encouragement literally means to give courage. There are people around you who need a little bit of courage. You know, most people look fine until you realize they're not fine. Most people seem to be getting along okay until it comes out they weren't okay. And we're losing a lot of good people these days. Church, let's shine the light of Jesus. Let's find someone and encourage them. Let's give them that that little bit of hope, that little bit of encouragement, a little bit of courage that they need. Whether they know Jesus or not yet, we can bring the light wherever we are. Ephesians 4.29 says, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. God wants to be a blessing to this world, but you know what he uses to be a blessing to this world? You and me. He uses us. And being as we're the ones who are in an elevated position because of Jesus, and and we're elevated because we have hope. We have the light of the world living within us. Our foundation, our soul, can be secure because we're tied into his love. We're wrapped in who he is. We have the hope. And so we should be the greatest encouragers in our sphere of influence, whatever that is. If you're at home, you should be the greatest encourager of your children. If you are in the school, you should be the greatest encourager of those students around you. When you're at work and everyone else is complaining about what's going on, you can be the one with a good attitude and saying, you know what? I see that you're really gifted. You're, you're awesome. Did you know how good you are at that? You know, we can choose to look at all of the negative things about a person, right? But how much better if we pull out the one or two things 
and pull them aside and say, wow, you are so good at that. How did you learn that? Show me what you do. And we can be the ones to bring hope to a world that is seemingly lost in despair. And we can be that light. Because church, first off, our hope is secure in heaven. Through our faith in Jesus, we have a direct line to heaven itself, to the very presence of God. Because of that hope, we have a relationship with Jesus each and every day. I hope you're taking time. I hope you're not just going from thing to thing to thing. I hope you're taking time with Jesus. Spend time in the Word. Spend time just in silence with Him. Spend time in prayer, lifting up your needs. He's there for you. He he loves you. And lastly, let's be like Proverbs 25 says. It says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. I pray that we our, our speech would be sweet for the people around us, to the glory of God, and for the salvation of other people. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for your people. God, I thank you that our hope is real. God, it, is, it has gone before us into heaven already. Where Jesus himself is, he sat down at the right hand of God, having won the victory for us. Lord, help us to look past our circumstances. This pandemic has not been easy in a lot of ways. Lord, help us to be secure and firm in who you are and in who you say we are and in our our relationship with you, Jesus. And Lord, help us to see and be led by your Spirit to go and speak words of truth and life and hope to the people around us, God. Help us to find those little positive things that we can speak into and encourage each other today. I thank you for your people, Lord. I thank you for this beautiful day. Help us to enjoy it to the fullest. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. If you're feeling up to uh, showing off your wacky sweater, in a picture, we'll meet over here in just a minute. If anyone is able to uh, help us carry gear away, that's great. And last but not least, I totally forgot, life groups are starting in person. We might have some online options. If you would like to be a leader or you just want to be part of the group, please sign up on the back table. We're going to have a leader meeting this next Sunday. Two weeks after that, we're going to start with our life groups. So they're coming. I'm excited. Being together is awesome. So. God bless you. Let's go ahead and meet for our picture.